so excited to share this uh, talk, a new reality for surgeons. And I just, I'm also excited to share with you that my computer crashed twice in the past five minutes. So uh, just bear with me as I try to make it through this talk. Starting with this. Uh, my only disclosures are related to Sonic Insights in which uh, I'm the Chief Medical Officer and the current Board of, board of Directors. Now, I think in the past decade, we've seen an increasing interest and in cer certainly documented in terms of publications with regards to mixed reality in medicine. And the drivers for this really have been related to uh, increasing interest in patient safety, uh, increasing use of minimally invasive surgical techniques, and an emphasis on surgical simulation. Uh, the objectives of this talk are to go over some of the definitions with regards to mixed reality, uh, some of the technical issues reg with regards to the development and deployment of this sort of uh, platform and applications uh, in medicine and specifically in urology. Milgram in 1994 coined the idea of a reality virtuality continuum where you have uh, augmented reality on the one end, which is uh, basically optical see-through uh, technology with a computer overlay of additional uh, information all the way through to a virtual reality simulation in which the user is uh, immerse in a fully 3D environment. Now, the common elements to this type of uh, mixed reality platform is that of some sort of tracking system that estimates uh, where the user is within that environment and a correlative display system that can actually conceptualize uh, where that user is. In medicine, we have seen examples of hardware uh, displays that utilize augmented reality. As far back as maybe 10 years ago, we've seen the use of tablets and mobile devices acting as windows uh, into uh, another world, allowing us to conceptualize and give further information with regards to what we're seeing around us. The advantage of this, of course, are that uh, with, the, with the prevalence of mobile uh, computing, uh, it's very intuitive and has high penetrance. The limitations are the fact that uh, it's hands-free, it's limited field of view and limited conceptual information. Another example of how augmented reality has been presented in the past was that of a fixed projector uh, that can project informational displays onto a surface such as a wall or a patient. Um, and the advantages of this are that it does not require any tracking and it's hands-free, but the limitations are mainly around that of mobility and that once it's set up, it has to stay there. It's really sensitive to environmental effects like lighting obstruction and obstruction and there's no 3D-ness to the experience. The world has really moved to the idea of high density flat panel displays of some sort, or even better, to some sort of head mounted display. And we see these in the form of video see through devices uh, as presented through Oculus or HTC, or optical see through devices such as predominantly uh, manifest by Microsoft HoloLens. If we're talking about the, the development of an integrated surgical uh, navigation platform, we have to somehow leverage medical imaging and to a point, we've been able to do that. We've been able to take uh, images and volume render them. We've been able to develop models and so on. But really, we have to take it to the next level. And those elements outlined here in red, segmentation, modeling, registration, tracking, display, user experience, and the integration of this into a full, uh, fully formed platform remain each, uh, each one of these elements remains a, a large body of research. If we just take image segmentation uh, uh, for a moment, that involves the creation of, um, or the acquisition of medical images, the reconstruction of these into digital uh, form, uh, 3D, uh, 3D digital form, and then usually hand isolating areas of interest. And, uh, and that can be uh, usually by, through the use of experts. Uh, once you have these created, we can create 3D meshes or models and begin to manipulate them. Segmentation challenges to date really are related to the fact that even though clinically we look at a, a number of, of, of clinical studies and consider them to be acceptable for clinical interpretation, there remains a wide variation in data set quality uh, at, the, at the data level in terms of manipulation by algorithms. As well, class labeling for segmentation is usually has historically relied on uh, experts uh, hand labeling things. And again, this is prone to variation and opinion. Probably the state of the art with regards to segmentation in the future lies with the leveraging of machine learning, as with many things in medicine these days. So semantic segmentation here through the example of uh, NuNet, which is a machine learning algorithm that has performed exceedingly well uh, 
automatically segmenting up the different pathologies in abdominal organs in several competitions and for which we're using for a number of our projects. Once you have those models and meshes, you really want to use them in the real world. And for that, you're going to have to put them onto uh, the video display that you're getting from the field. And there's a certain workflow to this in order to transform those models and uh, make them fit. And there are many, many considerations with regards to uh, registration and how to do this uh, very accurately. You can go from 2D to 3D or 3D to 3D. Uh, there are extrinsic fiducials or intrinsic fiducials. You have to decide whether your model is going to be a rigid body model or somehow be able to be deformed so that it can be matching the uh, real world situation as you're performing surgery in real time. Perez et al. performed a, surgery, a survey of the surgical AR literature and, and demonstrated that for the most part, optical uh, marker-based fiducials have dominated the literature with regards to registration strategies so far. The challenges with registration, as many of you have probably uh, seen examples of, are the fact that complex motion can often throw off registration, and this can be as, uh, as minute as breathing, uh, uh, organ shifting, or intrinsic organ motion. As well, internal organs tend not to have a lot of surface characteristics, uh, such as if you imagine looking at a liver surface or a spleen or a kidney. Uh, there's not much detail there for algorithms to latch on to and continue to track for the whole case. As well, there are visual complications that we as surgeons take for granted that we just operate through, but that algorithms also have difficulty in processing, and that includes things like specular reflection, shadowing, occlusion, and so on. From a platform point of view, we really demand that uh, whatever platform is developed work no matter where we deploy it, no matter what type of procedure, and that it performs well uh, separated in instances over time. And this, again, is a registration challenge to make sure that this continues to perform as expected. Not often talked about in the literature, but uh, is an operational consequence is the fact that uh, setting up these workflows uh, has a certain cost, time, and complexity. Uh, oftentimes, the process of segmentation and registering uh, those images and calibrating the whole system uh, into the op uh, operative uh, workflow requires up to 60 minutes before the patient even enters the room, and this is often unacceptable to both surgeons and the ORs. So again, the state of the art with regards to registration probably does lie, again, with some leveraging of automation, perhaps in the uh, realm of machine learning, and Zhang et al. here demonstrate uh, leveraging some aspect of machine learning to create a markerless automated segmentation and registration workflow with quite good registration error. And this is just one example, not necessarily the best example, but just one example of how this might look. Now, in terms of applications, mixed reality has really found a foothold in medical education. And Rodriguez Abad et al. Um, performed a survey of the medical literature with regards to augmented reality and found several pedagogical advantages to AR related to the acquisition of procedural skills, the ability to help learners uh, make informed decision in decisions, uh, and the ability to actually learn anywhere. So it becomes location agnostic. You don't have to be in a simulation center. You don't have to be in a clinic. You don't have to be in an OR. You can learn anywhere, and it creates a immersive and engaging environment. There's a specific use case as well that uh, uh, human anatomy it tends to be uh, particularly well suited to AR. And this is demonstrated here in the Anatomy X platform by Metavis, which is a, a shared platform through uh, the leap controller, and you can see that you can really begin to determine some of the relativistic nature of anatomy and, and, and learn it uh, in, in its true context. It's not just pretty, though. It has been shown to um, in, improve acquisition of knowledge uh, above baseline, and here's a study by Bork et al., which demonstrates uh, use of a device such as Magic Mirror, but also related to head-mounted devices that acquisition of knowledge and retention of knowledge is superior to just book learning. Augmented reality has also seen um, uh, penetration and use in procedures. Here, Shobadal in 2020 conducted a, um, a trial in medical students using Microsoft HoloLens facilitating bedside procedures. And here you can see the HoloLens being used to facilitate a user catheterization and found uh, excellent uh, uptake by students and acceptability. 
On the other side of the spectrum, you can have full bore simulation, such as that here demonstrated for a VR holup um, uh, system created by Vertimed. They also have modules for TRBT and TRP. A trial was done here uh, uh, in, in both novice, intermediate, and expert surgeons, and there is very good acceptability for this type of simulation. The state of the art for mixed reality in medical education, therefore, probably does lie in, in an application that is mobile, that's affordable, provides granular feedback for learners to allow them to improve on an ongoing basis and meets some sense of accreditation standards for learning. Here we see an example by, uh, by a, uh, called Precision OS, invented by a local orthopedic surgeon that's uh, now taking the world by storm. However, I feel that in terms of um, performing operations, surgical planning and execution uh, remain one of the holy grails of augmented reality or mixed reality in, in uh, surgery. Oftentimes we see the uh, leveraging of medical imaging into the field through the use of augmented reality. Here, the surgical AR platform, again by Medivis, allows surgeons to use the Microsoft HoloLens and see and manipulate imaging in real time while they're performing an operation. And this is, has been shown to facilitate procedures. In fact, federation of uh, all sorts of informational displays from the OR can be performed into the Microsoft HoloLens system. You can get a live feed, you can have fluoroscopy, perioperative imaging, other room data, all fed into the same view so that you don't have to move your head, you don't have to look for data. And again, this has been shown to improve operational efficiencies. This is only one step towards getting to real-time facilitation of operations, however. On the other side, we see uh, surgical planning. So pre-planning, you have informational data from the patient, you create models, and then you perform the operation essentially in virtual reality before you actually perform the operation in patients. So Jamie Lanneman and the Clayman group here created virtual reality simulator for PNL. And in trials, they demonstrated a improvement in mean blood loss and fluoroscopy time and a trend towards decreased numbers of punctures for this uh, procedure. The same platform was used in a trial demonstrating uh, laparoscopic donor nephrectomy advantages, again, with similar outcomes. So taking a, a step further, closer towards real-time uh, navigation, we see a Spanish and Italian group here. The, on the left-hand side is the da Vinci prostatectomy, and on the right-hand side is the da Vinci partial nephrectomy. And the Tile Pro at the, on the left-hand side, you can see the 3D models being registered to the field, helping to direct the operation. Uh, in fact, it's not actually registered. There's a research engineer sitting next to the surgeon who is manually trying to register the models to the image. But it gives a sense for what this kind of platform could be like if we could automate that registration step. On the right-hand side, the Italian group did generate very high-fidelity models of the patient pathology, and uh, we're able to create overlays into the surgical field of the robot. However, uh, despite being, being deformable, the surgeon themselves had to manipulate the image intermittently through the procedure to provide any, any utility. Kong et al. in 2017 and many others have demonstrated the utility of external fiducials rather than trying to rely on some internal uh, uh, marker of uh, the intrinsic tissue. Here they're using a gold, standard gold marker that is an infrared label so that it can be visible in the infrared spectrum. Uh, they're, they're doing trials in pig kidneys here and in ex vivo models, they can implant these fiducials, scan them, create models that demonstrate good registration, even in uh, deformation. And in the lower half of the slide here, you see that they've done the same in in vivo pig uh, kidneys, uh, implanting the fiducials percutaneously and then scanning the pig demonstrating good creation of meshes and very uh, submillimeter uh, registration accuracy. It seems a little bit implausible though that in terms of a clinical workflow that we would be implanting multiple fiducials even if they were percutaneous into our patients ahead of the major procedure uh, unless there were some uh, particular complexity to the procedure itself. However, perhaps utilizing natural orifice would uh, be more acceptable here, um, UNL, created a specialized ureteral catheter that had LEDs that created bright and dark areas that an optical sensor could detect specifically and then redisplay in real time back into the video feed. 
therefore highlighting the uh, outline of the ureter during the procedure. And this is outlined in a, again in a pig model. Um, I find this probably would be uh, very saleable to our gynecology colleagues. Dr. Peter Black from our own department has been trialing the use of an interoperative real-time registered uh, model here of da Vinci robotic prostatectomy. Here we see multi-parametric MRI scans segmented out into this purple model that are real-time overlaid onto the field and registered in real-time using uh, intraoperative transrectal ultrasound probes. Uh, in personal communication, Dr. Black continues to feel that this does provide uh, a high degree of utility with regards to helping to direct the operation. Similarly, we have had the opportunity to develop a tumor-centric optical fiducial marked um, uh, platform for robotic partial nephrectomy. And this was published several years ago by my uh, then PhD student and continues to be one of the um, prime examples of how optical fiducials and augmented reality can assist in this operation. So the state of the art in terms of surgery execution and a real-time surgical navigation platform for urology probably does lie uh, in terms of an application that can support extrinsic or intrinsic fiducials and or tissue tracking some form of automated segmentation and registration to facilitate the overall workflow uh, and, and a demand by us for a continuous submillimeter accuracy level tracking that would look something like this. And this is a, uh, this is a Polish group uh, that hasn't published on this. Uh, this is all just on their website. I would like to note that UBC is a leader in this area. There are multiple faculties from computer science and applied sciences working on various aspects of this workflow from computer vision segmentation, registration, and the UI or display. And I've been uh, fortunate enough to participate in, in, in several of these types of collaborations that were listed here, along with some of the publications that have come out of it. In summary, the urology state of the art with regards to mixed reality shows that it is a slowly growing field, mainly because it is technically challenging. However, because it is technically challenging, it is an area ripe for ongoing research and development. The application space likely will grow very quickly now with advances in machine learning techniques and ongoing advances in display technology. And I wanna thank you very much. I wanna thank my computer for not crashing and I'd be happy to entertain questions.